Hello and welcome to video two of chapter 17, blood. So brief talk about plasma. Plasma is the liquid portion. It's almost all water, 90% water. So it's a 10% solution of solutes. And that includes uh, the things listed there, uh, you know, salts. I, didn't, I don't think I put, I put minerals, but you know, ions in addition to all of the nutrients like carbohydrates, amino acids, lipids, uh, dissolved gases that you're breathing in and exhaling, hormones and waste, all that stuff. Now, the form el formed elements or solid things are together called hematocrit. And hematocrit uh, is the same stuff you see in the slide that I'm trying to go to here. It takes its time. Hematocrit's this stuff down here, right? This solid that forms at the bottom. Uh, erythrocytes are by far the most common of those formed elements, your red blood cells. This shape is called a biconcave disc. There's two concave sides and uh, a big sort of thick outer rim. This gives it a really, really uh, optimal surface area to volume ratio. If it was a sphere, it would have a lot of volume, but not as much surface area to go along with that volume. If it was flat, it would have way more surface area than it needed for that amount of volume. So this is kind of in between, which means that it really uploads and downloads gases uh, really quickly and efficiently. Most of the inside of that red blood cell is hemoglobin if you take away the water, uh, which obviously fills it. Uh, there are about 250 million molecules of hemoglobin per red blood cell, and each hemoglobin carries four oxygen, which means you get a billion oxygen per red blood cell, approximately. The hemoglobin can assume three different uh, shapes, basically, uh, conformations. Oxyhemoglobin, when it's loaded with oxygen. Deoxy, when it's not. Incidentally, you can tell the difference between oxy and deoxy hemoglobin by color. Uh, oxyhemoglobin is bright red. You see that in arterial blood, whereas deoxyhemoglobin is sort of a darker red or almost purplish color, uh, which is venous blood. If you ever spring a leak and it's bright red, you're in a lot more trouble than if you spring a leak and it's sort of a slow flowing purple. Uh, Carbaminohemoglobin is when you when it carries CO2. It's actually carried somewhere else. It's not carried by the same uh, uh, structure that that oxygen is. And we see that here. Here is a breakdown of, here's a drawing of a hemoglobin molecule. Uh, each one of them, so this right here, this little quarter of this that you see here, is one component of the hemoglobin molecule, which consists of four polypeptide chains. At the center of each polypeptide chain is what's called a heme group. And that's illustrated by this little red disc right here. And at the center of the heme group is carried an iron uh, atom. And the iron atom is, that's why we need dietary iron for the most part. And the iron atom is what allows the hemoglobin to bind to oxygen. So that's the pick up and drop off point for oxygen. Uh, the, a hormone that stimulates erythropoiesis, so hematopoiesis is just manufacture of blood. Erythropoiesis is the manufacture of red blood cells. Erythro, erythrocytes, poiesis, uh, synthesis. So it makes sense that the hormone that would stimulate that is erythropoietin. We learned about that in the last chapter. Well, your kidneys release erythropoietin and what stimulates them to release it? These things are what stimulate it. So You've got a low red blood cell count, low hemoglobin, low iron, low atmospheric O2, all those lead to low oxygen. So basically saying that if your tissues aren't getting enough oxygen, if your kidneys aren't getting enough oxygen, they're going to release erythropoietin, which is gonna kick the red blood cell manufacturer into gear. Uh, turns out people that produce more testosterone produce more red blood cells. This is this accounts for males generally having a higher red blood cell count and oxygen carrying capacity than females. Uh, generally, I should say, you know, people vary. You make about 100 billion of these a day, which means that you lose 100 billion of them a day as well, on average. Uh, they'll die, as we'll see in the next screencast, they die about every 100 to 120 days, but I'll show you that in the next one. What do we need for erythropoiesis? All of these things, iron obviously, amino acids to make the proteins, 
uh, lipids to make the membranes, carbs to make a lot of the components that go along with those membranes and proteins, and then vitamin B12 for DNA synthesis. Now, if you think about it, I previously stated that the red blood cells are anucleate bags of hemoglobin. That means they don't have nuclei, which means that they don't have DNA. So why do I need DNA in a red blood cell? Well, because in order to make those cells initially, they all have nuclei and they all have DNA. So you're making 100 billion cells that require DNA every day. Now that nucleus eventually disintegrates and goes away, but if you don't have vitamin B12, you are unable to continually make that, uh, that DNA. So a vitamin D, B12 deficiency can give you a, a type of anemia, as we'll see later. Uh, most of our iron is bound up in hemoglobin, as free iron is toxic. If you have iron atoms floating around, they're very harmful, they're very oxidizing. That's why they bind to oxygen so well. And any iron that remains is kept in storage proteins or in transfer proteins. And that'll be good for this first half of the second, uh, yeah, forget it. This is good for video two.